Hello there, and welcome back. I'm Martin, and today on Daddy Roll the One, I'm going to be talking about how I use pre-written adventures um, when I'm running a game. This is part of my campaign prep series, but I'm going to be discussing how you can adapt, change, and just overall be flexible with a pre-written adventure, whether it's something as small and, and you know, simple in a way as this uh, 28 page uh, adventure from 1980 that I used for my daughter's campaign or whether you're using and you know an adventure path or one of those big hardback adventure books that cover you know levels 1 through 20 or whatever like from Pathfinder or 5e all of those are things that you can take parts of those and adapt them to your campaign so that you're running it the way that you want to you don't have to feel held to the adventure as written so I'm going to be talking about how to adapt uh, an, a module like this or an adventure, how to flesh out the NPCs, again, to kind of make them fit more within not only your world, but also to help you work with the NPCs to make them things that are going to be useful for the players and what the players adapt to. OK, and then I'm also going to talk a little bit about how to deliver the exposition for your world, how to provide the information of the background that you might have in your head or maybe you've written it down to your players rather than just dumping a bunch of documents on them and expecting them to read it. Because I have found through decades of play that that is just not a real good way of going around it, uh, going about it, uh, because players just don't want to read that stuff as much as we think we're clever and we've written the world's best campaign document with this rich history and, and all these battles and all this stuff that happened before the player characters were around. Player characters don't normally care about history that happened before their characters were around. They care about what their characters are doing. And so expecting them to read something like that um, I've had DMs before give me like 12, 15 pages of stuff that they expected me to read. And I'm a DM, so I get it. But that's not really something that I'm interested in. And so I'm going to talk about different ways that you can provide that exposition at the time when it is relevant to the players rather than expecting them to read it before you start playing. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about using pop culture and other sources of inspiration to, um, you know, adapt something like this to kind of make it a little bit more um, just a little more fun or different, more creative. You know, this module has been around a really long time. People might be aware of it already. So with that said, this is module B2. Modules are what they used to call ventures. And the reason that they called them mod modules is because they were modular. The idea was you could take this as a DM. And back then, DMs were creating their own worlds and they were writing their own adventures. And so the idea of having a module was that you could insert it into something that you were already doing. They didn't have adventure paths back then. Um, you know, I guess the very first one kind of in a way, if you think about it, could kind of be like the giant drow and queen of the demon web pits series of modules. But they didn't call those adventure paths. And th th that was an outlier back then. So normally you had the kind of like these one-off adventures. And this is a perfect example that was intended to be inserted into an ongoing campaign. So it is a module. Okay. So, uh, but this was written around 1980, I think it says, and it was inserted into um, the very last printings of the Holmes basic D&D box set. And then it went out in every printing of the Moldvay D&D uh, basic set. And so because of that, this is the most probably widely distributed, also probably most widely played module from the early um, days of Dungeons and Dragons. So that means it's also a good thing if you're looking to like collect old stuff, you don't have anything yet. This is probably a good place to start, partially because it's going to be less expensive than a lot of other things that didn't have as many printings available. And then also it's um, written as a um, to train DMs. Uh, as a first time DM. So it talks about, you know, how to be a good DM and how to, you know, manage time in the campaign and how to divide treasure among the, the characters and all that kind of stuff. So that's all really good information that could be helpful, again, no matter what edition of the game that you're running. So um, you should be able to find this also as like a PDF, I think, on DMs Guild or Drive Through RPG, stuff like that. But um, you should be able to also pick this up on like eBay if you, if you really wanted to in, in order to, um you know, get a physical copy of something from back in the day and for not as much as you would pay for other adventures that were, again, like I said, more rare because there were fewer printings of them. All right. Anyway, so diving into this, one of the first things that we notice is that um, there's no setting for this particular adventure. So a lot of the AD&D adventures were placed in the world of Greyhawk. 
the basic and expert sets of D&D. They were not allowed to do that because they had to be separate. So they couldn't place it in Greyhawk. This was written early enough that the known world wasn't really a thing that that known world ends up becoming my star. And that does become the default setting for the basic and expert sets. But that wasn't really a thing yet. So this is generic. It's called the keep on the borderlands. The keep is not named. The borderland is not named like what it's protecting you against is like the forces of chaos. The NPCs that run here are not um, named, uh, you know, they're, they're given titles, but there's no names. So that's one of the first things that we need to look into. Okay, so it talks about all these different areas that are at the keep. Okay, the gate and the flanking towers and the and the entry are what's really interesting about this or you know, I, I guess it's interesting. The way Gary writes this, he writes it as though the player characters are going to intend to break into all of the quarters of the people who live here and steal their stuff. So every place here, it tells you like for the, there's a jewel merchant who lives in these apartments. It gives you what his AC is, his hit points, his attacks, tells you what kind of treasure he has and where it's hidden in there. So it's a, it's supposing that the players are going to do it. Now I know my players, I know that they're not going to do that. So uh, I didn't have to prep that, right? It's it's partly just kind of knowing who my players are. But I'd also ask them, what do you want to do? So one of the things that had happened in the previous session, they had met uh, the head of, or not the head, but he was a member of a guild at the Keep. And um, he had hired them and said, like, you know, his wagon had broken down. And he said, hey, can you bring me uh, to the keep and I will pay you if you escort me there. And then if you ever need a job there, it was this guy I showed him in my last session. Uh, I, I found this picture on Pinterest somewhere, but, and it said, once you're there at the keep, you know, I'll get you in, I'll pay your fees at the gate, the taxes. And then once you're there, if you ever need something, you're looking for work, come find me at the guild hall and I'll have a uh, work for you. So that is a, you know, again, a lead that I'm giving them. I'm giving my players something. Now it's up to them whether they want to do that. And they eventually did, but it took them quite a few sessions to eventually um, go meet with this guy. So we have finished playing through this module by now. We're still playing this campaign, but we moved on to a different adventure. But it took them about 20 sessions to get through this total thing. And I don't think they met with the guy at the guild hall until maybe like session five or six. But anyway, he had done that. And so uh, I had gone through here and looked at all the different NPCs that were listed. And they all are just listed by name or I'm sorry, not by name, but by title. So it will say things like, you know, again, the, the jewel merchant, the smithy, the trader. Okay. There's the provisioner. There's a priest. None of these people have names. They're just all titles. And so one of the things that I had to do was assign names to them. So that was one of the first things that I did was assign names, but even more importantly than a name, what I needed to do was look at how have my players been playing and who do I anticipate that they're going to want to interact with the most? I knew that my players liked shopping. It's one of the things that they really liked doing at their first session was looking through the list of equipment and picking what, how much they were going to spend. They were sharing gold between each other. You know, one player had rolled more starting gold than that. I once said that they were sharing it back and forth. And so I had to figure out, okay, they're going to go shopping. And so there were two places in here in the, in the adventure it was the um, provisioner and the trader. And so, again, I was using a lot of stuff that Professor Dungeon Master used on in his Caves of Carnage campaign. And there was a um, provisioner and a trader. And so he had those. And I kind of took those ideas and he made them like estranged brothers. And I thought, okay, that's a fun hook. So I kind of copied that. And then what I did in my notes was I just wrote down some personality traits for each one of them uh, in terms of like how they talk. Like, you know, one of them talked really fast. The other one talked really slow. I was making them very different from each other because they didn't like each other. And it was giving my players, though, an opportunity for them to go to, um, you know, different places to buy. They didn't have just one choice. They could go to, you know, um, either the provisioner or the trader. As time went on, I stopped writing, handwriting my notes. I talked about this last time and I started uh, typing my notes out and printing them like this because it was just easier for me um, to read like during my session. Okay, but um, I had uh, notes on those two brothers that came up. Okay, so, uh, but I went through and I created all these different, like I printed out all these pictures. They all came from Pinterest. 
and I named all these different people. And I had, well, the bailiff and the scribe, I did give them names here. I just gave them titles. I had an example of what a keep guard would look like or a crossbowman. My players didn't know what a crossbow was. So they were buying them and using them. They didn't know what it looked like and they didn't think to look it up. So I just printed out a picture of a guard that was carrying a crossbow and they were like, oh, wow, that's big. Like I didn't anticipate that it was that big. So that's that was part of a thing I learned very early on with these players is that descriptions weren't enough and just printing out a picture, putting it in my DM notebook and then showing this to them during the game was a huge help. Okay, so I'm going to go through and talk about some of these uh, NPCs later. Okay, but um, uh, so I had my list of all the different businesses and stuff that were at the keep. Now, I mentioned before I was using this map that I found um, online and the professor also uses it. You can just Google for 3D map of the keep on the borderlands and you'll find that right away. And then each one of these was keyed to a building that was written down. And again, I'm not going to show that because that came from the professor dungeon masters, Patreon, but you could just do that yourself. Just rewrite the descriptions that are in here and put them next to the map. Like it's, that's one of the things I don't like about how some of these early adventures were done is it has all this list of things that are in there, but it's not next to the map. So you're constantly flipping back and forth. This map is of the caves. It's not even of the keep. So you have to find the map of the keep in this book. I don't like doing that. That's why I transferred everything to this notebook here. And then I wrote notes and my highlights are things like who is the, who those people are and you know, what they're, um, what their goals and things like that are. So that's a thing for NPCs again, would be writing down what are their goals. Okay. And, and like a secret for each one. And if you just have that, um, and you might not even use it during the game, but if you have those two things written down, then when your players interact with those NPCs, you, the personality will kind of just unfold as you are taking them through, uh, conversations with those different NPCs. So I kind of knew, um, what my players were going to want to talk to. They were going to talk, want to talk to the, um, to the provisioner, of course, I knew that the priest in my group, the cleric, was probably going to look for an outpost of his faith. However, we had made it clear when he made that character that his faith was sort of um, not very common in this part of the world. And so it was going to be highly unlikely that in, an, in a fringe location like the Keep on the Borderlands that they would have an outpost for his faith or like even a shrine or something like that was probably unlikely just because his faith wasn't as well known um, as some of the other ones. And so he was aware of that, but he wanted to look. And so um, I could have created something for him, but I didn't. And I was doing that for part of my world building. Okay, so as part of the world building in my game, one of the things that had happened early on uh, and it caused me to create kind of like two NPCs I wasn't necessarily planning on. Uh, the first one was um, one of the players in my game, I talked about this before, but she bought a miniature um, that she found like a, a you know, a, a loose miniature at one of our local game stores of a character that had a wolf. And she asked me during our session zero, can I have a wolf as I, as I start my character? and my old school initial reaction, I almost, I had to stop myself, but I'm also, I was almost like, no, there's, you can't have a wolf. That's, you know, nobody else has that. And, uh, you know, I stopped myself because really who cares? Right. So I started thinking about it. And I was like, okay, you know what? That was something that she wanted. She had bought this miniature. She was with her dad. She was excited about the game. So again, I don't want the first thing that I tell these players is like, no, you can't do that thing that you think would be fun to do. Right. So it's a different mindset. Um, I hadn't anticipated her having that, but I said, sure, you know what? You can have a wolf. I did. I think I talked about this before, but uh, it has to start out as a pup. So it's completely dependent on you. So uh, you have to take care of it. You've got to feed it. You've got it, you know, it, and it can't do anything. It's not like it's going to attack somebody or anything like that. It can barely not even like follow commands. Okay. And so she asked that. And then another player immediately said, well, can I have one too? And so there were two of them, right? So one of the things that I had told them was like, look, they had just come out of the goblin caves. If you remember that from a few uh, videos ago, and the goblins were like sort of teasing and even, um, you know, mistreating uh, their wolf pups, they weren't feeding them. And then they were teased them that they were going to feed them, but then they didn't. And they had kind of harmed them a little bit. And so the players hated that. They didn't like that. And I said, look, the caves aren't a safe place for that. If you ever plan to go back there, like you need to find something to do with these wolf pups. And so they were like, okay, maybe we could find somebody to train them. And I was thinking, yeah, okay, that makes sense. So you probably saw this picture earlier when I was flipping through, but that caused me to create this character um, that I called Vasilov. And he is a, um, I don't know how to pronounce this. It, it, it's, it's a Russian word. Skomorok. 
I think, but uh, basically there, it's sort of like, this is not the exact way to describe this. So forgive me because it's, it's not going to be an exact translation, but in a way you could think of it as almost like a Russian bard, like an early, you know, Slavic style bard type character. That's not exactly what it is. I, I know that don't, you know, don't come beat me up in the comments. It, it just, that's kind of how I thought of it. I'll just put it that way. Okay. So I, um, created this little mini on Hero Forge, and I just printed out the picture because I couldn't find it exactly what I was looking for. I also found this one over here. I think this is from a Warhammer miniature, um, but he had the trained bear, and that's what I wanted this guy to have was a trained bear. So, um, and he's he's a day drinker, so he's always at the pub during the day, um, having his you know whatever he's drinking. Uh, usually, it was the water of life, uh, which would be like vodka essentially. And um, he's got this trained bear and he stays there. And so they saw that bear and that was a clue that they, hey, maybe this guy knows how to do this. And he notices their pups. And so they ended up hiring this guy and he's not an NPC that was in here. So I had to adapt because I knew my players needed something like that. And so I created this guy. And if that hadn't worked out, I would have done something else. But they really responded to this guy. And they kind of tease him a little bit because I really get deep into like the idea that he's, you know, he's been drinking probably since before they woke up in the morning. And um, but he knows what he's doing as far as training these animals. And so he takes care of them. There's a couple of times where they actually forgot. And I was waiting to see if they were going to mention they were going to check in with their animals before they left and they didn't say anything. And then he'll kind of scold them like, Hey, I took care of these for you. Like, and I fed them and gave them extra treat and then they'll give him extra money because he's been doing this. But it was a way of kind of reminding them like, Hey, you wanted these animals. So like, you need to keep up with like what to do with them. So, uh, and he kind of became a favorite NPC of this group. Now he's also a singer. So he sings songs and I use that for exposition. So a lot of times I'll have him, I don't write lyrics to the songs necessarily, but I'll write titles and I'll say, he's playing this song. And if you ask him when he's playing, he'll tell you like, I'm singing the aria of the lost winter, or I'm singing like whatever it is. And that's always a clue. It's Every time it's relevant to something that is going to come up during that session, or maybe um, it's relevant to something that they'd already did that they hadn't quite connected. And then I'll, I'll give them the song and it's sort of like a little clue and they don't always figure it out and that's fine. I don't spoon feed them. So if they don't figure it out, we just move on. But every once in a while I've said, oh, he's singing this song and he, it's called this and I'll give them the, the title of the song and they'll say, wait a second. And they'll start to kind of like you see the wheels turning and they'll start talking out loud and having conversations about what this song is and what it could mean. And so that was another way for me to provide exposition through an NPC. So another one is in there. and I don't think I have a picture of him, unfortunately, but I put a dwarf mercenary um, in in the tavern. And so that was another thing. I'm going to show this in a second. But all of these people, with the exception of these people right here, were the tavern keeper and his wife and kids. And I got all these names from Professor and Dungeon Master's thing. So I just borrowed his names. Um, but all of these, I made up names. These are all people that were um, offering their services as like retainers, torchbearers, things like that. And um, one of them was a dwarf. And I stuck him in there. And um, the uh, he was, he's very misogynistic. And so all of the players in this game are, they're all young women. They were at that time, they were between the ages of 10 and 11, except for one dad, right? But all their characters were also younger women. And so I had this guy kind of saying like, oh, you know, talking to like the, the older dad players character, the, the cleric. Like, why was he traveling with all these young, young children? And like, what could they do as adventurers? Like they were calling themselves adventurers, but they didn't look like they were hardly, you know, old enough to, to like be out of diapers. He was kind of like teasing them a little bit. And my daughter and her friends, they hated that. And it, that's kind of what I wanted. I wanted to like give them the sense of like, you know, um, a way that they could be empowered by like maybe getting one up on this guy. And so anyway, um, he was teasing them about being young and, and, and not being very strong and, and, you know, like what, what could they do as far as adventuring and things like that. And my daughter was like, she's like, we're going to attack this guy. And I was like, you're going to what? And she kind of backed off and then really surprised me. And she said, I'm going to, um, I'm going to challenge him to an arm wrestle. So she said, yeah, I'm going to challenge him to an arm, um, arm wrestle. And I thought like, okay, that's, that's fun. Like, that's a good way to handle this. So uh, she did challenge him and he almost was going to laugh her off, but he's like, no, I'll accept this. And so 
uh, I had her uh, basically just they made a strength check. So they made a strength check. They added their um, melee attack bonus to the strength check. And she rolled really, really well. And he rolled horribly. And I rolled right in front of them. So I always roll dice in front of the players so they can see I'm not like fudging anything. And he rolled like garbage. And she handily won this arm wrestling contest. And uh, actually, I think at the time, if I remember correctly, he was so confident. And he did. He had an 18 strength. I'd rolled him up. And so uh, I think that he had... um he had said he would actually go up against two of them, but even if it had just been my daughter's character, her, her role was higher. Uh, but there were actually two, it was her and her friend. I think they were both two of the elves and they both like jumped into to arm wrestle him. And so he lost like handily. And so I thought, okay, like, how is he going to deal with this? And so I used my handy dandy um, reaction rule table here. So this is a table that is part of um, basic D and D, but it's a two D six table. So it's a bell curve. And basically the idea is the lower you roll, the worse that the person's going to react, but because it's a bell curve, you're going to get more results in the middle where the DM can kind of then depending on the situation, see what's going to happen. All right. And you add your charisma bonus. In this case, I didn't add the charisma bonus because, uh, well, one, my daughter's character didn't have one, but I wouldn't have added it anyway, because, um, uh, the guy was upset. He was embarrassed. And so adding the charisma bonus wouldn't have really worked. I thought that like he wasn't going to um, react to them properly. He was probably going to be angry. So I rolled the 2d6. And actually, I think I asked my daughter to roll it. So she rolled the 2d6. And it rolled really high. I think I got like a 10 maybe or an 11. I don't remember the time. But I do remember being quite surprised how high it was. So not only did she win the... Um, the the result of the arm wrestling contest but then she rolled this reaction roll that was very very positive and i had this guy kind of change his tune he he was like he uh he he's a big boisterous guy um he always talks about himself in the third person but he um and that was part of the things that I did as part of his NPC trait, so that they will always know who was talking. If I just start talking to his voice, they'd recognize it partly because he was just saying his name over and over again. But um, that was just kind of a gag that I did. And so they um, he he ends up like apologizing to them. And I did that because of this reaction role. And that's not something that I was expecting. So not only did um, did they roll this reaction role where he apologized for kind of teasing them uh, for not being very strong or being very capable, uh, he actually offered himself up for hire, which wasn't the plan. He was just going to be sort of like this one-off kind of goofy NPC. I just had him in there um, basically as a way to kind of, uh, again, give give them a chance to see like, what are they going to do with this guy if he's teasing them for being younger players or younger characters. And, um, but I, I rolled with it. And so I, I had him offer his services for hire at a discount versus what he should have charged. And they hired him. And it's so it just became so much fun because um, he was always thinking like, you know, expecting them not to perform as well as they did. They were way more capable than he thought. And he would constantly tell like other people about them. And uh, sometimes he wouldn't show up for work, but then he wouldn't charge them because he'd say, like, you guys don't need me today. Um, you know, I don't like, you know, I like action, things like that. Anyway, so that was this guy. That was uh, another NPC that I created that I hadn't really planned on. Um but again, I'm adapting to what my players needed. So they, um, you know, again, I knew that they were going to want to go shopping. I knew they needed an animal trainer. I also knew that they were going to need to hire retainers. Okay. So I put time into those NPCs knowing kind of ahead of time that like these are going to come up more often. Things I didn't put time into were like the Castellan of the keep. I gave him a name, but that was really it because he's the ruler of the whole keep. There's no reason that they're going to be interacting with him. So I didn't have to spend time on that. I spent time on the things that I knew were going to come up and I had kind of had to anticipate and some of the things that I spent time on, they did didn't use. There were times where I had to come up with NPCs kind of like on the fly. And that's where stuff like in this module, this adventure, there's stuff in the back here that's pretty handy. So there are NPC personalities. And during a game, I might not necessarily roll. I might just look at the list really quick and kind of like out of the side of my eye and then just say, oh, this one, and then real know how to how to role play an NPC that I hadn't planned on. They're brave or they're careless or they're honest or they are very talkative, things like that. And having those types of random tables, I've talked about random tables so many times in, in books that I've shown and like reviews. If you want to look at my reviews playlist, you'll see most of them are toolkits and they're things like that that you can use during a game when something unexpected happens that you just hadn't you know planned for so um it's you know it's being able to think on your feet 
Uh, again, I don't really roll on those during the game. I find it easier to just look and like, you know, look at the first thing that I see and pick that. Uh, every once in a while, I'll, I'll kind of just look around for more inspiration because the first thing I see doesn't really fit what I'm going for. Um, and but if I'm planning ahead of time, I might roll because that's where you get unexpected things that you wouldn't normally pick. But in any event, um, that was uh, some of the NPCs. Now, another one that was in here uh, was the bailiff and the scribe that were at the gate that were writing their names down as people were entering in. So I talked about that a little bit before. And so I had pictures of them and I showed what they looked like. But one of the things that I did for foreshadowing for those guys was the second time there's the bailiff and the scribe. So I described the bailiff. He's, he's, he's very proud. He's, he dresses very well. Um, he's obviously, you know, he's kind of like that, that upper middle class where he's trying to move up. Right. So he's, he's a very important person. He's probably the one representative of the castle and that they're going to talk about the most. Well, things that I had happen over time were like, he had changes, his demeanor started to change. And then one time they came to the gates and he had like these two dogs with him, Brutus and Cassius. And I had him introduce the dogs to the characters because he was so proud because they were a gift from this traveling friar that just so happened to like bequeath these two dogs to him as, as a gesture of friendship. Well, it turns out that friar actually had an ulterior motive, but you know, the players didn't know that. And that character certainly didn't know that, but little things like that, little by little, he would have these. And then, um, you know, one time he would be there and hit the dogs wouldn't be with him or, or maybe he wouldn't be there at all. And so it's foreshadowing certain events just because they get used to seeing things in a certain way. So another thing, just in terms of changing pre-written things to adapt to your campaign. So one of the things that is in this adventure is that there's this traveling priest. I was just talking about him. He's the one that gave the two dogs to the bailiff. Now I did that basically because I wanted the players to be interested in this traveling friar. Now, if they hadn't followed up on that, that's fine. But I was giving them a clue. Like this friar got these dogs from somewhere. He's obviously wealthy. So in this adventure, that traveling friar is actually um, a chaotic priest. He's he's a, he's part of a cult of chaos. And that's important later in the story. And so I had planned that like all along. But again, I told you it took them about 20 sessions to get through this thing. Well, what had happened is along the way, I had introduced other characters to them. And by the time they got to the part where they were going to interact with that traveling priest, they had actually already been betrayed by at least two people that they had trusted. And it was kind of becoming a thing where I was like, I can't keep doing this to them or one, you know, they already don't trust a lot of people, but they, they knew of this traveling friar, the cleric player had talked to the traveling friar a few times in the pub. So I had made notes in here about how to, how to run that friar where he would sit and, and talk to them and, you know, buy them an ale to save each other's souls because they're from competing faiths and all this kind of stuff. And he had two acolytes that had taken a vow of silence. Um, I really did that because I was just running out of different voices and, and voice quirks to use for different NPCs. And so that was just me being a lazy DM, but it also, it did help because it made these two people never speak and they went traveling and, I guess spoilers here, if you're in a place I should have set that up from, but this adventure has been out for so long at this point. I don't think I need to call spoiler alert, but um, th the idea is that the priests are going to betray them. They're going to offer to go with them into the caves of chaos. And then at a certain key moment, they're going to betray them. So I had that planned all along, but what happened was because I'd done that gag a couple of times already through NPCs that actually weren't even part of this adventure. They were things that I inserted into it at the last minute. I actually changed my mind. I had it planned all the way up to running that adventure that I was going to have him betray them. And I was like, that's kind of lame. And so I actually had him just join them. Now his two acolytes did turn their backs on him uh, on the, on the players, but the main priest did not. And that actually became a better story because the cleric player, his player doesn't trust priests from that faith at all. He, he, that was partly something that he wrote in his background. So by having this guy not betray him, it's causing him to rethink what he thinks of people from that faith. And then, you know, just come to find out these two acolytes were never part of that faith at all in the first place. So, um, that became a kind of just a, a cooler storytelling technique. And again, I'm adapting. I'm being flexible and on the fly and making decisions. I'm not running this and trying to shoehorn something into my game that didn't necessarily fit or wouldn't have made sense or just wouldn't have been fun. 
Okay. And so that's a thing with a lot of these pre-written adventures. I think there's, especially if you're a new DM, because this is how I did it when I was first starting out, I had this thought that like, well, I have to use it as rent because this was written by a professional person that knows how to write an adventure. And if I'm not running it the way they wrote it, then I'm not doing it the right way. We've come a long way since then. And I think, you know, there's just whole parts of this that I just cut out completely, especially just like cave after cave that just wasn't, it just got very repetitive. So I just, I hit the main high notes. And um, even for something like, um, it's one of the reasons I don't like adventure paths. Okay. I'm not a big fan of those because I think there becomes a tendency of like, well, this is written out. So then as a DM, you feel like you want to get your money's worth, but also it's written. So maybe I don't have to prep as much because it's all in there, which is actually a fallacy. I think you have to prep more for a pre-written adventure because you didn't write it. So you have to make sure that you understand how everything flows together. But also there's this tendency to kind of want to force the characters to follow the story that was written in this adventure path to move them up in levels and encounter the things that get them the experience point and do a lot of stuff. So it's, you can't be, I don't think as flexible to your players and what they want to do when you're trying to put them on these adventure paths. So that's one of the reasons that I just don't use those as much. And I mix and match smaller adventures like these and take the parts that work for me and what I want to do and run them that way. Okay. So that's part of it. Now I want to talk a little bit about exposition. So uh, I was mentioning before, you know, writing all this stuff and we think that like we're being super creative, but players don't necessarily want to read that. So what I found is the best way to provide exposition is during the game when it's relevant to the player at the time. So even if it's something that like a history thing that, you know, everyone in the world knows that this thing happened, well, I prefer to deal with it more of like, okay, let's not make it so general. Let's make it more specific and then have certain people bring it up at times when it's relevant. So again, it could be a song being sung by a bard, or uh, it could be a variety of things. Now, uh, this is another idea that I took from Professional Dungeon Master's um uh, you know, his dungeon craft channel for his Caves of Carnage campaign. But he uses these like message boards. So I think he said he got this from um, Hackmaster's Little Keep on the Borderlands, I believe is where he said he got the idea, but I loved it. So this is just a cork board. And I printed out all these little signs because my handwriting is terrible. Um, so we've talked about this before, but I printed all these little signs out. And this is the exposition. So when they go to the tavern, I just handed this to them and they looked on here and then they started to see what was interesting to them. But the exposition that they needed to know at the time is on here. There's a chapel that has services. Unrepentant wizards and witches are not welcome. So that means something. And they saw that and they were like, okay, that's something we need to be aware of. Um, where there's entertainment, potion tastings, haircuts and surgery, okay, for healing is available. Um, people that needed work. This is where they found out that people were offering their, their services to go, um, you know, on adventures to, to be torchbearers or, or, you know, load, you know, carry stuff, carry treasure, carry things like that. Giants are sighted on the road. Okay. Where to stay if you need to stay. Um, I talked about uh, this gang called the Chicken Hawk Gang. This is for the rogue character if she wanted to join a gang. I left a clue here for her if she wanted to follow up on this. I took this Chicken Hawk Gang name from, I found a post online. Somebody was talking about how they adapted to keep on the borderlands. If I find it, I'll put a link in the show notes. It's full of great ideas. So that's where I stole that idea from. Okay, so a bunch of these uh, signs, again, came from Professional Dungeon Master. I just want to keep mentioning that so you know people are aware that I'm aware of this. He's aware of it. I've talked to him before about it. I've shared this on Twitter, and we've chatted about it. But so, again, I'm not stealing. I'm DMing. I'm borrowing these ideas that really work for me. But what I would do is I would change these all the time. So you see this one, there was a guy who was looking for escort, and I originally had it labeled, I think, at two days. Um, I think there was even another one. I had it three days and then I reprinted it and then I um, ran out of time to reprint. So I changed. So I changed this every time they weren't in there. Uh, the time, uh, the date changed again. They never met with this guy. They weren't interested in this, but I just wanted to keep it there. And then after that one day, it like disappeared. And then later on, what happened was they ended up traveling to a completely different part of the, of um, this area. And they went to a new tavern and um, which was where uh, this guy was looking to go. 
And so they went there and then they found he was leaving signs there asking to for travel back. So it was like keeping that kind of world building alive that like this is a guy that's just around and he just travels back and forth and he always needs armed escorts. So that's also telling them that that's a problem that like these these, um, you know, caravans are going to be attacked. There's a thing in here about bandits and how much money you can get if, uh, you know, if you have information about bandits. This was the one about the missing fiance. So I think I talked about this before. This came up on my random um, table of road encounters where they uh, encountered a guy that was just about dying. He was, he was dying and he gave them this ring and he said he'd come to get it to give to his fiance. And, um, uh, you know, but he he died. He was attacked on the road. And so he gave it to them and said, hey, will you return it to her when you get there? And, um, you know, I would really appreciate it. And they felt so bad for this guy. So they took it. And so when they get to this town, one of the first things they see is this woman is looking for this guy. She didn't know what happened to him. And so they had to seek her out and find her and return this ring to her. And um, so then what I did was I used a 5e mechanic. I know I'm mixing, you know, additions. I do it all the time. And that's just how I play. So uh, the I gave the players advantage on their next role because they had returned that turn. Now I could have just given them plus two or something like that, but um, I honestly like advantage and disadvantage. And so I do use it sometimes rather than bonuses and penalties in my BX game. So these signs were changing all the time. So what that meant then was that I was always adding things. And again, I'm foreshadowing. So there was one here that talked about a candlelight vigil being held to honor the memory of the brave guards that were lost in the caves. That was foreshadowing it was going to come up later. And um, I'll talk about that in the in the future, um, what happened with those guards. OK, but there was uh, this one missing a knight of the ancient order of the fox who left to hold a vigil and never returned. OK, and then there was one about a lost baby. Uh, there was one about the wedding procession of Lady Rowena, and it was inviting, you know, nobles, merchants and educated peasants could come watch this. And it became this huge parade and party and there was music and there were uh, cakes that were decorated. And there were flags and all kinds of, and the players loved it. Like they spent so much time at, at that and that, but it was, this was leading into another thing. She ends up getting kidnapped and it was a whole thing. So they were there and saw it happen. Um, a reward for information about smuggling operations on the river. And then this was a really fun one. So wanted for murder. So this is a wanted poster for the character, the younger sister of that joined. If you saw that video on like how to add a new player to the campaign, she came in late and I created the character for her by her request. She wanted me to. And um, that character's background was that she was wanted for murder and she didn't commit it. Um, the player decided that. But there was this one poster. As soon as they walked in, they saw this on the board. They were like, holy cow. Like It was reminding her, hey, you're a wanted criminal. You can't walk around in broad daylight. Like You're very distinctive. You've got face tattoos and or war paint, I think she had. And um, so she needed to kind of like maybe be a little bit more careful when she was just walking out and about. So those are kinds of things that I did in here to kind of you know, uh, again, provide exposition. So I could have read all these things to them. Oh, you can't go out at night, like the rules of the keep, or, you know, I could have had an NPC tell them like, oh, the gates close at sundown, things like that. They're probably not going to remember that. But having this where they could refer back to it, it's constantly changing. But a lot of these things do stay up there. I changed this in terms of when the services are going to be held at the chapel. So it helps them keep track of the calendar. So they know what date it is whenever they see this. So um, this has been a huge part of the campaign and they love it. And I use it even in um, the new tavern that they're in, in the new part of the, you know, the new um, city that they're in. Uh, I just changed the, the signs, but I, you know, kept the concept. Okay. So um, that was it. Now talking really quickly about how to adapt, um, you know, different kind of things from, from pop culture books or movies or like whatever it is. So I did, I was inspired for this idea by, um, Professor Dungeon Master. So he did a thing with one of his caves. It was the Cobalt Cave, and he changed them to kind of like these cannibal dudes. And I thought like, okay, that's creepy, and I like that. But one of the things I really liked was that the leader of that group, the chieftain, if you want to call it that, he called Captain Kurtz, I think. And um, it was it was from Apocalypse Now. That's who it was. It was the Marlon Brando character. And that he did it. He gives the whole the speech at the end about seeing the snail, you know, crawling on the thing. And I was like, that that specific video, I'll put a link to it below in the show notes. That was the one where I saw that. And I was like, I'm totally going to run this like the professor does and then adapt it. So one of the things, though, that I added is if you remember the Dennis Hopper character that was in Apocalypse Now, um, 
has a kind of a crazy kooky character. And so I put him in as well. And so he was sort of like the, the herald of what was going to be happening. Now, of course, none of my players with the exception of the dad player had seen apocalypse now, but even he didn't really see it coming because you're just not expecting it. But I used the inspiration from that as far as the window dressing of how these caves looked. And um, so I changed the design of the caves a little bit. And then um, it gave me an instant speech that I, you know, I printed it out so that I could read it during the game. Um, you know, I highlighted some certain things, but that was the speech that, that um, the Colonel Kurtz gave or Captain Kurtz and they were from the cave. So they got lost there and like a bunch of them became cannibals and ate the other half. And so the characters are finding bodies and, and um, you know, uniforms and things like that in the caves. And it freaked them out when they realize that like, this is why, the people in the keep were holding a candlelight vigil because these guards went here, never came back. So that was kind of the foreshadowing. And it happened a few sessions before it wasn't like the day of. So it was this ongoing thing so that when it was revealed that this is what had happened to those guards, it totally took them, um, you know, off guard, pardon the pun. And uh, they, they were like totally freaked out and they loved the speech given by the Colonel Kurtz guy that I read. And when I was done, they actually clapped. Now, one of the reasons they did that was because I practiced this so many times. So we only play about once a month. So at the, the previous session, when they had told me what they planned to do, which was go investigate that cave, I knew that that was going to come up. So I had time. I, so I, I found the actual, um, you know, speech online and I printed it out, as you see, and then I highlighted it and I just practice it all the time. I practice on my morning walk. I practice if I was driving around by myself. And I also practice like the one for the, the Dennis Hopper character who I just called Hopper. Uh, and that was just a joke for me and the dad player. If he clued into it, and he didn't at the time, he realized that after when I gave the, the kind of the, um, Marlon Brando monologue, he was like, Oh, like I just saw his face. And he afterwards, he's like, that was awesome. Um, the girls had no idea. All they knew was that, you know, this guy had given the speech that they really liked, but I committed to it and I didn't have to read it. So I had memorized it enough where I had my notes if I needed them, but I didn't actually have to look, do them. I, so I was, I was looking at them like individually as he was talking, but also like the Dennis Hopper character. I really, I really played it up. It was like, you know, they said, Hey, we're, you know, cause he had his guard uniform on still. And so they said, Hey, are you from the keep? Do you know, Colonel Kurtz, like, you know, can I, can we, can we talk to him? And he, and, you know, and, and like they, they set me up, right. Cause they didn't know what he's going to say. And I was like, man, you don't talk to Colonel Kurt. Like, um, you know, you listen and sometimes he says hello and you, you'll say hello. And he doesn't even see, he walks right past you. It's like, he doesn't see. And so I'm not doing it well. Cause you know, it's been a long time since I did this, but I really practiced it. And I didn't make it quite as like spacey drug addled as Hopper's character is in, in that movie. Um, but it was enough that like it gave him a distinctive personality and um, he didn't die actually. So that character could theoretically still be around in the caves. Um, so anyway, that was, a, a, you know, just an example of like taking something completely unexpected, like an apocalypse now and just not the whole movie, but a specific scene foreshadowing it a little bit and then inserting um, some parts of it to kind of help bring this a little bit more to life. So one of the things that's about this is that it's really just a condominium of monster caves. And it doesn't necessarily hold together when you think about all these monsters just living there, because why would they be doing that and not always fighting? But that is one of the things you can build into that is figuring out why and then coming up with reasons and changing the monsters. I didn't want to use cobalts. I didn't use cobalts. I put a lot of human bandits in there. I put a lot of other things in here that weren't part of this. I took out a lot of things. So I didn't use hobgoblins myself, um, which are part of this. So um, I'm changing and adapting. And that is something that anybody can do, um, even if you're a first time DM. It's just kind of knowing what are the things that are going to excite you and help you be excited so that your players will be excited. But also, have you been listening to your players so you know the kinds of things that they would respond to during a game? So those are some ideas on how I, uh, again, adapt things like that and um, work on NPCs. I'd love to hear from you in the comments, like, how did you run this module or have you run it? Does it sound exciting? Does it sound like something you want to do? And how would you do things differently? Or, um, you know, just, you know, any comments that you have about this particular video or also my series on campaign prep. I would appreciate comments. Also below, you'll find places where you can find me on social media. You can join me on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, and I'm on Blue Sky. And, uh, you know, I, I post pretty frequently. I'm on Twitter like every day at least. Um, the other ones are probably a little less frequent, but at least once a week, I would say I'm, I'm on there talking. So 
join me on there. And, you know, those are the best places where also you can share photos of your collection or or your old character sheets, whatever you want to share. And I'd love to see those and talk about them with you. Um, I also do have a blog. I don't mention this all the time, but um, when I create content, I do create, uh, at least in the past, I've created content specifically for older versions of D&D, and I just shared it for free on my blog. So you can go there and find all that content. There's a link below. And you can also below find a link to my shop where you can help support my channel by buying something like a t-shirt, hoodie, mug, poster, something like that, featuring an exclusive design that's only available at my shop. The holidays are coming up. These are great gift ideas for gamer friends or family that you have. And it's a way to help support me and my channel to help me put some more money into it. So just as an example of recording today, I'm recording on my phone. My phone is old. I just, you know, it just, it just is. Okay. It is what it is. So, um, the memory's dying. And so even though I've like deleted a bunch of apps and a bunch of photos, um, I can record at most about seven or eight minutes of video at a time before I have to stop. That's why it's constantly like changing, um, light tones, but also just voice will go up and down because I have to keep stopping to, um, record. So I'm only mentioning that to point out, I'd like to get away from that and do something new. And I'm trying to figure out like, if you have suggestions, I would love your suggestions on what kind of equipment would make the most sense for doing these sort of overhead shots that I do where I'm showing my collection. Um, I don't necessarily need something where I need to be on camera myself right now, other than, you know, my hands moving things around. So um, any suggestions you have for that, I would really appreciate it. And anything that you buy from my shop does um, go back into the channel so that, you know, I'm saving up so that I could buy something like that. OK, so that's it for this particular video. So uh, coming up next, I'm going to be doing another history video. Uh, I will reveal the topic later, but I think you guys will all enjoy it. So um, that'll be uh, probably airing, I'd say, next week. This is the week of October 2nd, 2023. So I imagine it'll come out the week of October 9th. October 9th is also when I'm going to be doing the drawing for my uh, having reached 500,000 subscribers video uh, giveaway. So I did a short video on that. So look in the shorts and you'll see a video for 5,000 subscribers. I'm doing the drawing on October 9th of 2023 at 12 p.m. Pacific time. So you have to get your entry in before that. All you need to do is watch that short and then uh, tell me what you would wish my next video would be about. And um, I will enter you into the contest and you'll be getting a copy of the classic D&D game rule booklet from 1994 and also uh, a t-shirt of your choice from my shop. So that's it for this video. And I'd like to say thank you very much for watching. Happy gaming, stay safe, and I will talk to you next time. And now for the bonus content, what I was drinking and what I was listening to when I was working on my notes for this video. So drinking wise, I was having some of this. This is um, Italicus, um, or I guess, you know, in American English, uh, Italicus, <laughs> but this is um, Rosolio di Bergamotto. So it's a liqueur that is based on the bergamotto or bergamot oranges. So it's a citrus liqueur, despite this um, gorgeous kind of bluish green bottle. Um, it's more citrusy. Uh, there's a little hint, a hint of like maybe some rose petal, some thyme. Um, it's a little on the sweet side. Um, there's a tiny bit of like amari or, uh, you know, bitterness from an Italian Amaro style liqueur. Um, normally I wouldn't drink it neat like this, but that's just what I was doing last night. I was kind of sipping on it a little bit. Um, but it's, I would use it more as a mixer in a, in a cocktail, something where, uh, if you had a cocktail that called for an orange liqueur, you could swap that orange liqueur for this. So a little sip here. Mm. Okay. And um, yeah, again, it's a little on the sweet side. Listening wise, I was listening to this Blade Runner. This is um, one of my favorite movies of all time. Definitely in my top five, even Blade Runner, the original. This is a fun picture disc, as you can see of the music by Vangelis. And I just love the soundtrack. There was a time when uh, like my early work career, uh, where I would listen to this in the car on the way to work when I was commuting. And then when I got to my office, I would put it on like in a CD, I'd pop it in and listen to that. Um, and it's also a good late night soundtrack when you're just trying to chill out, trying to focus when I'm trying to write or like example, take notes. Um, it's just a great soundtrack. I love movie soundtracks, movie scores particularly. Um, and this is definitely one of my favorites. So um, why not, you know, if you've made it this far in the video first, thank you. I love when people watch this part. Um, but tell me what your favorite movie soundtrack or score is. I'd love to hear about it. Okay, thanks. And cheers. And I'll talk to you next time.